Lord, help us to realize that you're the one who matters within us. What we bring to the table with the good food doesn't amount to that much. But what you bless, what you put in us, means so much more. Father, prepare us, prepare our hearts, prepare our ears to hear your word, Lord. We ask your anointing now to be on our pastor, Chris, as he, as he brings the word. Father, allow us to receive how you would like us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Last week we began a new sermon series and we're talking about underdogs. How at some point in our life we, we may all feel like underdogs. Some of us live our entire lives feeling like we're underdogs. Like the odds are stacked against us and there's nothing we can do about it. We, we use these different things that make us an underdog as excuses to keep us from fulfilling what it is God has called us to do. And last week we started it off by talking about how uh, we don't feel qualified enough and how God is is calling us to do things, but we may not feel like we're qualified to do that. Today we're going to move on, and I want to start off by saying, um, <coughs> when I first uh, reported, to my, when I reported to my first church, let me say it that way, it was uh, two small churches in rural southern Tennessee, and they have a tradition there, and when you go to these churches out there, a lot of them have what's called a parsonage, and it's a home that the, the church owns and the pastor lives in that parsonage. And so I reported to this church and, and these churches and, and moved into the parsonage. And there's also a custom they have. It's called pounding the pastor. Now, it's not as brutal as you might think it is. It's, it's, thank goodness, because the first time I heard it, I was, well, what? You know, pastor, pound the pastor. Uh, what they do is they would bring, it was customary, because it, these small churches like this, those pastors, they don't make a whole lot of money. Okay, not, I mean, it's very little uh, you survive in the house, they give you a little bit of money to survive on, and that's about it. So what they had this customer doing was pounding the pastor. They would bring sacks of food, usually canned goods and stuff like that, to the church. Pounds of food was the uh, thing, and bring them to your house, and that's, you would eat from that for a while until you got your, your bearing straight figured out what was going on around you. So all that to be said, they, they pounded the pastor, and they brought all this stuff in, and, and we got it, and we were trying to make, you know, figure out what we're going to cook and how we're going to do this. And some things we're looking at, well, I've never heard of this in all life. Why do you cook this? I don't know. You know, and, and we figured it out. We, we looked at that. Um, but this one sack we opened up had cans in it that had no labels. <laughs> and we, well, what are we do with this? And have a night where we surprise. <laughs> so let's just open it up and see what it is. So my wife got the can out and she opened it up and just kind of held it over the pot and it was sitting on the stove and it's poof, the stuff just poofed out of the end of the pot. And she and I both just looked over the pot and she said, what is it? And I said, I think it's dog food. <laughs> Thank you. 
quick to label everyone and everything. Are you conservative or are you liberal? Is it rock or is it country? Or is it hip hop or whatever it may be? Is it in high school we labeled people, they were the jocks, they were the geeks, the alternative people, the motorheads, the, the good old boys, you know, the, the people who wanted to be in a rock band, had the hair, like 80s hair band style, you know, all this stuff. When it's a celebrity goes off the deep end, we tend to say that they're kind of crazy. Uh, you know, I know uh, reading an article a while back, the, the Titans quarterback, Jake Locker, was talking about how the most hurtful thing he's heard since he's been quarterback in, in Nashville was that he has been labeled as injury prone. He said that has hurt him more than anything else. When you go to the doctor's office and you fill out a form, it asks you to label yourself. Are you married, single, or divorced? I never understood why it made a distinction between single and divorced. I don't understand that, but it asks you to, to make that distinction. Labels can be cool, they can be funny, they can be helpful, but they can also be embarrassing and hurtful. Last week I shared with you some of my own story about how I was um, height challenged, I guess would be the, the correct term, a height challenge for my youth. I talked about how it prevented me from doing things I wanted to do, like play football. I used that as an excuse. I carried a label with me that I was short. Labels are nothing new. We we found examples of them throughout history, even in the Bible. In the Old Testament, there's a story about this underdog who was labeled. He was a guy who, who wanted to be used in a great way by God, but from the time he was born, he carried a label. His name was Jacob, and he let this label keep him from being the person God had called him to be. His story is found back in Genesis. Jacob was the grandson of a man named Abraham. Now, most of you have heard of Abraham. Abraham is considered the father of the faith of the three major world religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Abraham is considered the father of those three. He placed his faith and trust in God and was promised that he would be the father of many nations. Abraham is the only person the scripture ever refers to as, as he was a friend of God. Now Abraham had a son named Isaac, who then had two sons, they were twins, named Jacob and Esau. And the people of Israel would descend from Jacob one day. Now when Jacob and Esau were born, uh, Esau was the first of the twins born. And you know what carries in, in the tradition of that, that faith, that culture, what comes with being the firstborn. You get everything. You're, you're the, the heir. You're the one to receive the blessing. You're the one to receive the estate. And Esau was the first one born. But when he came out, the Bible tells us that Jacob had a hold of Esau's heel as he was being born. It was almost as if it seems that, that maybe Jacob was trying to wrestle Esau back to take his place, to get in that first spot in the front room. So his father gave him a name, Jacob, which means a deceiver, undercutter, someone trying to steal, a cheat. That's the name Jacob. That's the name he was given at birth. Seems kind of cool though, to name your kid something like that. Now, if you name your kid Jacob here today, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, but I'm <laughs> sorry. It doesn't mean that anymore. <laughs> so at the very beginning, Jacob was given this label, a label that would, that would make him an underdog. Just hearing his name every day reinforced that label. You imagine hearing your name every day reminding you of what your, your parents thought about you. Unfortunately, Jacob lived into that name. And he used as an excuse to carry out some pretty sneaky things. One day Jacob was cooking up some stew and his brother comes in from being gone and he said, comes in and says, I'm starving, give me something to eat. And Jacob says, I'll give you something to eat. Give me your birthright. Give me, give me your firstborn status. Give me the things that will come with that. I'll give you something to eat and do that. And Esau says, well, if I'm dead, it doesn't matter, so okay. And he signs over his birthright to Jacob. 
Later, as their father Isaac was nearing the end of his life, he was, he was prepared to give Esau the family blessing. And Jacob tricked his blind father into thinking that he was Esau, and he received the family blessing in Esau's place. Now, as you can imagine, Esau wasn't real happy with his brother. And Jacob couldn't seem to escape that label that he had been given. He allowed his label to, to serve as an excuse to make choices that he made that hurt himself and that hurt others. Have you ever known anyone, maybe yourself, who just couldn't seem to escape their past? One bad decision leads to another, which leads to another, and they get labeled as a screw-up. Or maybe they get labeled as the, the black sheep of the family. It's likely they begin to embrace this label and they say, well, it's what's expected of me. Why shouldn't I? We've all been given labels at different points in our lives. And sometimes they're given to us by others, and, and sometimes it's it's on purpose, and sometimes it's inadvertent. Some are positive, some are not. But no matter how hard we try, we just sometimes can't seem to shake it. Now maybe, just maybe, you've been guilty of labeling someone else. Have you ever done that? Have you ever given someone a label that stuck with them, that caused harm? You know, in the early part of my life, I was in a, a served on submarines in the Navy. And being on a submarine was, was a different lifestyle. And it took a special kind of person, a certain type of person, I should say, to be able to, to do that duty. And they put us through a lot of testing to make sure that we were past, that we could do that. We could, we could make it three months out of sea on the submarine. And even still, the guys who were on the boat decided that it was their job to test people. Because on a, on a submarine, everybody depends on everybody. Else, your life may depend on the guy next to you, and you want to make sure that person next to you is somebody who's not going to lose their cool under the stress that might something that might happen. So, some of the guys would take that more experience, would take it upon themselves to, to test the new guys. And there was this one guy who came on board one year, and, and I, for some reason, decided it was going to be my responsibility to test them. And I pushed him, and along with several others, we pushed him. And I finally, I gave him this nickname. And it seems, if I, I'm, I'm not going to go into all that, but if I told you the nickname, you'd say, so what's wrong with that? But it's why I gave him the nickname that caused the pain. It was really very cool. And when the name got out, and the reason why I gave him that nickname, it caught on quickly and it spread fast. And it caused the sky lose his cool. And he snapped. And as a result, he was kicked out of the submarine force. He was sent to the surface. Wait. Today, I still feel great remorse for that action, but and thanks to Facebook, I was able to, to find this guy. I, I reached out to apologize to him. You know, and, and a happy ending would be for me to sit here and say that, that he forgave me and all is well. But that's not the case. He's not forgiven me as far as I know. But what I find insane is that we have this kind of power <coughs> over people. That we have the kind of power that we can change other people's lives simply with the words we speak, simply by giving them names, simply by giving them labels. Now, I doubt Isaac really realized that the name he gave his son would have such an enormous effect. But the labels we wear, we wear can shape who we become, and eventually who we become catches up to us. And it happened to Jacob. Jacob made his brother so mad that Esau rounded up a group of men and came after Jacob. He's ready to kill them. And Jacob made Jacob decided it's time to it's time to take a vacation. It's time to get out. You know, want to get out of town? You know, want to get away? Ding, you know, that's, he's out of here, and he goes to another land to live for. <coughs> Time goes by, and God comes back to Jacob and tells him it's time to go home. So Jacob packs up his, his family that he's had now, his, his wives and his servants and all his livestock and all his possessions, and he starts heading back home. And then <coughs> along the way, he finds out that his brother has got wind that he's coming home, and he's heading out to meet him with an army. 
Jacob is in a world of trouble. So like most people who find themselves in hot water, now he decides, I better turn to God. Now it's time to turn to God. But even when he turns to God, Jacob is still trying, it seems like, maybe to manipulate the situation just a little bit. He goes to prayer, and he says, this is how his prayer goes, okay? Now, I'm reading excerpts of it. It says, O God, my grandfather, O God, my grandfather Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, you, you told me, return to your own land and to your relatives. And you promised me, I will treat you kindly. And he goes on to say that you promised me I will surely treat you kindly and I will multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as the sands along the seashore. Too many to count. That's how he's praying about you. God, you told me to go home. You told me you would take care of me. You told me everything would be okay. And now I get wind that Jacob's coming at me with an army. Don't you think you ought to do something about this? Have you ever done that? Pray your prayer or something similar? God, don't you think you ought to do something? What he's saying is, God, do I need to remind you that there's a lot at stake here? Even in prayer, he's trying to manipulate God. Jacob was reminding God of his promise, but he couldn't get past his leg. He's still trying to manipulate. He's even trying to manipulate God. And so he goes to bed that night, and he has this thought. If, just in case God doesn't listen to me, I should bribe himself. So he packs up some servants and livestock, and he sends them ahead. He says, go, and when Esau finds you, when you see him, and he asks who you are, tell him that you're servants of his servants. Jacob. trying to hedge his bets. We say we trust in God. We pray to God. We tell him our needs and our fears and hope that God will intervene. But just in case God decides not to do anything, I better do something myself. <laughs> if God has made you a promise, you don't have to take things into your own hands. You simply trust that God will take care of you. So Jacob has sent this parade of animals and servants ahead. He says, now, tell him that your servants are servant Jacob. Not the one, don't tell him the one that lied to him or, or stole his birthright, not his servant, but his servant Jacob. They leave and now, now Jacob decides he better spend some more time with God. He starts to feel pressure. They, they, they go on and, and Jacob decides it's time to spend more time in prayer. It's amazing how being in a tight spot can have such a positive effect on your prayer life. Doesn't it? Being in a tight spot will really have a positive effect on You'll pray more then than you've ever prayed before. But deep down, Jacob knows what he needs most now is God. He knew that if God didn't intervene, then he's a dead man. He realized that his days of trying to change his label through his own strength, they're over. His days of trying to do it all on his own were over. He had to give it to God. Can you identify with Jacob? Have you carried a label that defines you? That no matter how hard you try, you just can't escape it. Maybe you've been labeled lazy or, or trouble or incapable or, or trash or, or dumb or worthless or angry or depressed. No matter what you label, God has a message for you this morning that you are more your label. You are more than your label. God is bigger than any label that you've ever been given. And there's hope for you. Even if there's some truth to your label, even if you, you did something to earn it in a way, we serve a God who's able to remove the labels that seem to be forever planted with us. God removes them from underdogs all the time. We're told this night that, that Jacob worried about what would happen to him and his, his family and a man suddenly appeared on the scene. We don't know much about this man. He just suddenly appears and he wrestles with Jacob. The scholars will tell us that this man wasn't really a man at all, that maybe he was an angel or, or maybe it was Jesus himself coming early on. 
that God himself had come to rip this label away from Jacob. And it says that Jacob wrestled with God all night long, and when Jacob would not give up, the strength who touched his head and rinsed him out of socket. But still Jacob would not let go. Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Jacob was so desperate for God to remove the label that had strangled with him his whole life. So desperate that he refused to let go of God. He knew that God, if God could remove this label, he's going to die. Now, are you willing to wrestle with God? To press yourself into him? To step so far into him that you're willing to struggle and be there for him to remove your label? Surrender your life to him. Are you ready? Are we willing to, to listen more to what he says about us than what others say about us? Because he wants to remove our labels and give us new ones. Are you ready to quit making excuses and walking around like you've lost the battle already? Confess your labor. After Jacob had to own up, after Jacob had asked for his blessing, he's, the man said, What is your name? How did he reply? My name is Jacob. My name is liar, deceiver, trickster, manipulator, crooked, wretched. That's my name. I wanted Jacob to confess it. This is who I am. First, Jacob had to own up to who he was. The man replies in Genesis 32, 20, he says, Your name will no longer be Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and you have overcome. Today, I'm giving you a new one. You struggle with God, and then you've not let it get the best of you. Jacob, you are an overcomer. God wants to bless your life more than you know, more than you can ever realize. But as long as you live under the other labels, you're not going to be free to receive the label that God wants to give you. God wants to change who you are at the very deepest level. He wants you to understand who you are and allowing that to change you from the inside out. So what do you believe about yourself? What do you believe about yourself? What labels have been placed on you? The short one? The ugly one? The fat one? The skinny one? The failure? The not quite good enough? The dumb one? The geeky one? The screw up? The addict? The cheater? The unworthy one? The unlovable one? Some of us have been carrying around these labels for a very long time. And God wants to remove it. It takes a willingness on your part to wrestle with God, to step towards Him and say, I'm ready, change me. From the inside out, change who I am. Change who I believe I am. Are you ready for a new name? morning, Lexi took a new label. Child of God. Child of God. We all live that way. Child of God. <coughs> when you come to Christ and you confess your sins and you confess your mistakes and you tell him you're sorry, you tell him you want something you get a new label. It's called redeem. You're redeemed for your mistakes. That's just one of the labels God wants to give you. 